Hello everyone and welcome to episode 10 of Momentum Live. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you are in the world today. My name is Michael Hardinge and I am super excited about today's episode. We have someone who a lot of people will know and someone who I think is absolutely just an incredible person to chat to. So that's going to be really exciting. But before we introduce that person, I just wanted to thank you all so much for your continued support of Momentum Live. We've had such a fun time doing it these last 10 episodes and um, definitely something we fully uh, intend to continue doing even after we're able to go back outside and do more things again. But uh, let's kick off today's guest and meet Peter Hitchener. It's home. It's always been a friendly, warm, welcoming place. People are actually fascinated about what's happening in our town. That's human. And news actually is part of that. We're interested in each other. We want to know what the story is. We want to know what's going on. We need to give the stories the respect they deserve. You develop a rapport with the audience by being here all the time and by being on air and, and by not taking sides in, in political debates or anything like that, just by being accurate. Nine News. It's a privilege to be doing the job. Real people, real stories. Real news. Experience you can trust. Nine News with Peter Hitchener. I love my job. I absolutely love it. Melbourne's number one. And joining me is the nicest man in television, Peter Hitchener. Peter, welcome to Momentum Live. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, Michael, thank you very much for, for having me on your show. And good on you for persevering in this difficult time uh, a time when nobody's in the same room at the same time, and yet you still get the show to air every week. Good work. Absolutely. Fantastic. And also, for sure, and congratulations to you and the team for being able to do that as well. It must be a, a Herculean effort to be able to get the uh, the news to air any day, let alone in a global pandemic. But before we get into, I guess, how, how you've been continuing to do that, uh, maybe for those who are tuning in internationally or might not know much about your story or past experience, could you take us back to your beginnings in media? What what was it that interested you in um, in news and journalism? Well, oh, gosh, that's a great question. That goes back a very long way. Um, I was uh, I was at school. I, I decided in secondary school that I was interested. I had always been interested in news, and uh, I thought I'd, I'd actually like to to do broadcasting in some way, shape or form. Uh, radio is where I started. Um, and when I left school, I was lucky enough to uh, be offered a job at 4BH, which uh, I was in Queensland and living in Brisbane. Uh, and that was one of the main stations in Brisbane at the time. It was a news and talk format. And so I got to join their newsroom and I got to go out and do interviews and then come back and write stories and edit them up and get them on air. And uh, it was a terrific grounding. We did very long hours. We did, we did about 80 hours a week. So oh, wow. if you were working in breakfast, if you're doing brekkie news, yep. then in the afternoon you'd be out doing promotions mm. and, and vice versa. So uh, so it was, it was very, very long. But, oh, gosh, it was great, a great training ground, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, then I was lucky enough, that was in the 60s, and in about 1966, I think I joined uh, the ABC in Brisbane uh, and worked there for a while and then joined Channel 9 in Sydney in 1973. And I've been in uh, Channel 9 ever since, 73 to 74 in Sydney, came to Melbourne in 74, and I discovered this wonderful city and I thought, what have I been missing all these years? This is a <laughs> fabulous place. And look, it still is, despite the, despite the restrictions and the difficulties, I just love Melbourne. It's just a wonderful place. Good to be here. Absolutely, yeah. I think um, I, I love it. You, the promo put it so nicely. Like, I know you sort of grew up in Queensland originally, but, yeah, Melbourne really is home, and I'm so glad that you're able to call it home. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, so can obviously um, challenging times to sort of, um, for anyone, let alone trying to have a, a national organisation get, a, you know, news delivered in a timely manner every week. So what are some of the steps that you and the team at Nine have been doing to sort of um, stay safe, but also make sure that you're delivering the news to us every day? Look, it was a, a logistical, a real logistical operation right from the beginning. Um, when, when it became evident that, that there was a lockdown coming, uh, the building was locked down, except for those of us who need to be here for work. Yeah. Uh, many many of the team members actually have worked from home and 
are now returning a little bit at a time and for a, a day or two here and there. Uh, but mostly, uh, mostly people, it's only really essential news staff who are, who are actually here and, and in every day. They're divided into teams. So uh, our teams consist of um, uh, various people who don't actually uh, work at, we don't work, run into one another at work so that if anything happens, the news can still go on uh, using a different team if anything happens to one or other of the team members. Um, For sure. I personally am not allowed in the newsroom anymore. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure whether <laughs> whether that was, <laughs> I think it was for my protection, <laughs> but I'm not sure. And so I'm, and maybe it was they thought, oh, great, a great opportunity. Get him out of here. <laughs> um, but, um, but the thing is, I, I'm here in my dressing room at the moment. Um, and if you've ever seen Doctor Who, you'll know what a TARDIS looks like. And this is about the size of two TARDISes or two TARDI. Oh, wow. And so it's, okay. not huge. it's not huge, but it's fine. Uh, so I'm allowed in here briefly in the makeup room every day where they torch my hair and face into shape and then into the studio next door. So, um, you, you know... Uh, how the, what the layout is here, Michael. So yeah. that's that's how it is, and um, uh, so we all keep our distance. I've got my mask, uh, which I've taken off for for this uh, broadcast. But you know, we have we wear masks um, all the time, yeah. uh, and uh, but there is a dispensation for live broadcasting, though, because people need to be able to lip read, and um, you know, so unless unless you're in an area where where you can't socially distance from other people. Mm. people are, orders to can take their masks off and we have them off in the studio as well but they're right there beside beside me and as soon as the news finishes the mask goes back on for sure yeah, yeah. no i think mm. um it's it's fantastic that they were able to give that exemption to news broadcasters because it's really important for the deaf community to still be able to lip read um yes. so yeah it's fantastic they have been able to do that but it sounds like um a lot a lot of it i guess a big big change in the way that you kind of have been able to operate and work on a day-to-day -day basis. I know previously, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, you'd be someone who's, you know, fist bumping and shaking hands with everyone in the newsroom. So it must have been yep. a bit of a challenge to um, adapt to sort of being, um, I guess, quarantined and isolated at work in a way. Um, yes, very, much, very much. Because the world's changed, as you know, Michael, it's, it's, oh, it's a truism. Everybody can see that the world is different. And so all the things that uh, used to go with my job, which was going places, meeting people, shaking hands, going to functions, going to the Royal Show, um, ushering people through the studio. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what I do in my job is outreach and suddenly you can't do that. And so uh, I've, I've done endless and countless Zooms and Teams and all the other um, app kinds of uh, meetings that you yeah. can do these days. Um, and you sort of get used to, you know, Badly framed shots like this one that I've got here now, badly lit shots, nice views of the ceiling and the corners around the ceiling and uh, um, people not being able to be heard, people dropping out in the middle of a thing, uh, maybe the cat or the dog hopping onto somebody's knee in the, in, you know, in the <laughs> middle of a really serious, important sentence. Um, but it's kind of chaotic, but that actually kind of mirrors real life in many ways. It's not slick and smooth the way television production should be or usually is which is everything happens on time and happens perfectly For sure. in, in this kind of in the these kind of meetings things are a bit more haphazard and uh, it sort of mimics real life i think so i don't think people mind and i get a sense i don't know what you think michael but i, I don't think we're going to be going back to huge crowds for a long time yet what do you think Oh, look, it's um, a bit of a sad reality, but I think it's still it's still pretty a while off, I think. But um, at least we can still watch the news every night. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. For I sure. really appreciate it. Um, but we have a bunch of audience questions as well, but just wanted to say a quick hello to a few people in the comments. We've got Sam tuning in. We've got ST who says hello, Hitchy. We've got Aman from Iraq joining us. So welcome. Thank you for joining um, Casey's saying it's confirmed. Hitchy is a Hoovian. <laughs> um, you've, you've got quite the support base, um, across Facebook and YouTube at the moment. So yeah, thank you for everyone tuning in as well. And if you do have questions for Hitchy, please let us know in the comments. We'd love to ask them. But, um, but Pete, I wanted to chat. You've, you've reported on a lot of big stories over the years and, um, it's safe to say 2020 has kind of been like a year like no other. So, 
We know the news isn't always sad, but with everything going on at the moment, what sort of toll does presenting the news each night take on you? Um, oh, gosh, that's a great question. There's the thing about the thing about presenting the news is that you're never actually removed from the stories you're talking about. So, you know, if you're reporting on on someone's death, um, it's just like it's you know it's. It's not as though you can sort of do so from from a distance and and be removed from it. You know, yeah. these stories, they say, they naturally do. And some of the some of the, the terrible stories that we've covered, um, I, I, you know, obviously the pandemic is is the biggest story in a hundred years. Mm. Um, but we've had other other very stressful and difficult um, stories to cover. I was thinking in particular of the, the Black Saturday bushfires. Yeah. Um, uh, which is, which is, uh, which up until the pandemic was the most um, most difficult story we covered. Um, mm. It's just from a personal level. I mean, it, it, you remember, um, it, it, it felt as though the fires just couldn't be stopped, and yeah. and the loss of life was just horrific and shocking. And and visiting the areas as we did, um, pretty much from from the the Sunday morning after the fires, yeah, um, it was just it was just extremely difficult, and um, uh, and it really took a toll, I think, on us because um, you know we were we were reporting on community grief and community suffering, and um, you can only imagine what it was like for those poor people who were there when the fires ripped through. So there, you know, it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult sometimes doing these stories, but. You know, we have to do it. And, of course, uh, it is a privileged position. So we are privileged to be able to tell people stories. And there are nice things, too. Of We are partners, media partners of the Melbourne Zoo, yeah. which I just absolutely love. So we get to go to the zoo um, and go to functions at the zoo. And at the zoo, I've nursed um, a baby lion which, which for a story, which is unbelievable. Its mum was not far behind, uh, and there were sort of quite deep growls coming from not far away. So my time with the with the cub was lovely, and then I was able to hand him back <laughs> just to be on the safe side. But um, <laughs> but you know, it, so it's it's not always it's not always um, doom and gloom. But the stories that really stay with you, of course, are the serious ones, the the ones mm. that affect people. Yeah. For so, sure. uh, you know, we're, I think it's an honour to be able to to be able to tell, let people know what's going on, and share with them the stories of the day, and that's what that's actually what we try to do. Sorry, sure. we've, I've found a very noisy spot here. I should have closed the door. I hope you're still <laughs> hearing me over the the uh, conversations in the background. No, uh, that's okay. It's just I... nice to hear people having fun. Yes, it does sound like they're having a good little chat, so that's that's yeah. good. So <laughs> no worries at all. Um, I think you touched on bushfires there, and I think news plays a really pivotal part in getting information out, especially in emergencies. So um, not only from like the, the television broadcast side of things, but what sort of impact do things like social media um, have in terms of being able to get important information out to the public in a timely manner? And how have you and I guess the team at Nine sort of adapted and utilised social media to do that? Gosh, social media is very much in the news at the moment, but from from a broadcaster's point of view, it does give us the opportunity to um, share the results of citizen journalism, if you like, people with a camera um, able to record something that's going on and, and send it to us and, you know, an accident or just some some happening story, they're able to do that and share it with us, uh, mm. which is uh, actually very useful. Um, of course, there's a lot more to social media than that, and um, uh, that's probably an argument for another day. But as far as I'm concerned, I, th I think it's a very useful way of, of getting outreach to the audience, outreach to people who are who are interested in what we're doing, and to uh, to let people know. Well, we're, tonight we're covering this story or that story, uh, and if you're interested, please have a look. So I think it actually makes our job. Uh, it, it does a good job of. Uh, you know, of extending audience coverage and, and and audience interaction with those of us who are who are doing the news. Uh, sure. It's a it's kind of democracy, you know, democracy in action. I mean, but uh, 
you know, there's, there's a lot of angles to social media that have been talked about a lot recently. Um, and, mm. uh, you know, I'm no expert, so I can't really comment on those. For sure. No, I think um, social media is, in, in a lot of ways, a blessing and a curse. And this actually kind of leads into a question we have from Remy um, talking about, um, I guess, the rising of fake news and disinformation online. Um, what's the best way to sort of combat fake news on social media? <sighs> oh, boy. That's a great question. Um, uh, there's... I know that there's a, a growing push to have the the, uh, the companies that provide the social media platforms uh, be very proactive in in checking on what's going to air, what's going out. Um, yeah. uh, I think I think I hope the audience members are are sophisticated in in sifting through things and deciding. Is, is there any credence to this, or is this just is this just nonsense? Um, mm. I think I think uh, you know there may be immediate shocks along the way, but I think in time people just think, oh no, that's nonsense. That's just made up. It's just disinformation from somewhere. Um, For sure. I, I think people are discerning, and I think I think that that means that they are able to make those decisions. I know. Mm. I don't know. It's a good question, Remy, and thanks for asking it. I, 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 my answers obviously aren't definitive by any means, but thanks. For sure. And I guess it comes down to, to having a well-rounded um, source of where you get your information as well. So, as, um, you know, I don't want to say that Nine isn't always bang on the money, but it's probably important to sort of, you know, get information from multiple sources just to yes. sort of get a well-rounded... And, and verify things. And if... If, if the story isn't verified, if you can't verify a story, you have to make that clear and say this: this is being reported, or this is, you know, this is being suggested, but we can't uh, we can't run it down, so we don't know if it's true or not. Yeah, for sure. And I think news organisations do a great job at doing that mostly already. And like you mentioned, I think like Facebook and Twitter and stuff, they're getting a lot better at putting, um, you know, tags on news stories that might be flagged as having incorrect or false information in it too which is great so mm. i think everyone's starting to really up their game in the last few years yeah um, there's, there's been a lot of talk about that for sure um look we have a lot of questions coming through and i know you've got a uh, very limited time with this so i might just sort of quickly jump to a couple of other ones yeah, um Brody, i've been talking too long i apologize <laughs> no that's all good no worries at all um so Brody wanted to know what's the number one reason you love presenting the news uh, look, Brody, that is a great question, and I can't really tell you what the answer is, except that it's something I've always enjoyed doing, right from right from my first job at 4BH in Brisbane, uh, doing the news. Um, it's just it's it's there's something about sharing information with people that they may not know. You know, you may not have heard this, but um, that's I think that's it's fairly simple uh, sort of pleasure or, or payback you get from that I don't quite know why it is but that's that's actually what it is and uh and I love it and and people uh seem to be I think people seem to enjoy the, the fact that there is a service there and the, uh, there are many services in town so I'm not not necessarily just pushing nine news but you know people I hope are well serviced uh, with news uh news outlets in Melbourne and Victoria and um so you know the I hope there's plenty there for people to choose from, but I'm thrilled to be part of it. For sure. Amazing. And Matt wants to know, what has been your most memorable moment in um, presenting the news over the years? Oh, Matt, um, look, there have been so many. Uh, there's one, I mean, look, if we're talking about serious stories, we've covered some of those already today. Um, and their stories you'll never really forget, you know, the, the elections and and um, drama and catastrophe sometimes but there's also nice stories there was one um there was a there was a, a gorilla birth at the zoo a few years ago oh. and they trained they trained the gorilla the pregnant gorilla to present her stomach to the zookeepers so that they so that the vets could just check that the baby was forming the right way 
and that uh, the birth was going to go ahead. Oh, that's so uh, sweet. And so they invited me along, and at the, at the given time, into the into the uh, the enclosure, at the back of the enclosure where the gorillas live, um, they they asked her to come forward to the to the the little window to the opening, um, and I was actually able to look into her face. Oh, it was amazing! Look into this the face of this sentient being, and actually they said, "Go on, you can touch her tummy," which I did just briefly. And oh, that's amazing. I mean, it was one of those things, and I thought. I can't think of any other job apart from being a zookeeper where I actually get to do something amazing like this. And it's an experience I'll, I'll never forget. It was quite wonderful. Yeah, for sure. Mm. I, I, I'm a big softie when it comes to animal stories as well. So I always mm. love it when I see the new uh, yeah, Melbourne Zoo or Taronga Zoo in the news and things like yeah. that as well. Or even Hillsville Sanctuary, which is only down the road from the studios oh, too. Oh, Hillsville Sanctuary is beautiful. Oh, it's magnificent. Some of the, uh, they've got dingoes there and they've got, uh, they have the bird show. Oh, it's, mm. it's worth going. Uh, and, um, you know, it's going to be a while before we can actually start going back to the zoos, but when we can, it'll be fabulous. And in the yeah. meantime, they're doing a really nice job of, of keeping us posted online with, uh, with online sessions with the keepers and with the, with the animals. And uh, yeah, it's lovely. Worth yeah, for sure. Worth Even things like the, the live streaming of the Penguin Parade in Phillip Island. Like, there's so many yeah. fantastic... <laughs> Oh, we had a lovely story the other day where, where there was a, a Cape Barren goose on the on the beach and the penguins came marching up the beach and, the, and this goose said, you're not going any further, buster. And they all sort of took a step back and then eventually they just they summed up courage and off they went. It was very funny. It was very scary. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Um, so I've probably got time for a couple more questions. Um, Sarah yeah. wanted to know, as someone who's been involved in the Australian media for many years, um, mm. have you seen a change or is there any change you would like to see? Gosh, well, Sarah, there's there have been many changes, um, many changes, just technical changes, for instance. Uh, when I started, um, we didn't have the video uh, functions that we do now. Videotape was about that thick and uh, <laughs> it was on big reels and you had to have a 10 second roll up. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it took a, before the picture stabilized and and uh, most of our stories, though, were shot on film and um, uh, double per film, which had to be edited by the editor using a razor blade and, uh, and, and glue to stick the pictures together in the order they're meant to go in. Enormously time consuming. The film had to be processed, which took about an hour. So so getting stories to air was not the easy thing it is these days. Um, mm. Now you can pretty much cross to anywhere in the world at a moment's notice and uh, not have any, not think twice about it. But, you know, the, those things have come about over the years. But it used to be black and white, now it's colour television. Um, so that's on the technical side of things. Um, I think... I think news is is presented. I think in a much more relaxed way now. There's, it's sort of formal because it has you have a shirt and tie, and um, but but I think I think it's more relaxed. Um, and mm. um, I I hope I hope what we're trying to do hasn't changed, because I th I think our our job in news is to uh, let people know what's what's been happening. You know, if you give us a, give us an hour of your time, we'll bring you up to date on what's what are the big stories around, what people are talking about, thinking about. Um, we don't uh, television news doesn't have a uh, an editorial outlook about things. We don't, we, you know, we're not not involved in in politics or stuff like that. It's you know, just let people know what's going on. Let people make up their own minds about those sort of issues. And um, sure. so I think so. Technology's changed. But what we're trying to do, which is just be of service to the audience, I hope that hasn't changed and I hope it never will. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think, um, I think, yeah, especially Nine does a fantastic job at kind of just presenting things as they are, which is really good. And it's, um, it's good to know as well from people who are literally um, the face of that bulletin that you, um, you, you, you all do your best to be able to do that, which is, I think, greatly appreciated by everyone. Thank you, um, Thank you. yeah. To sort of wrap up, um, I sort of had one more sort of question, and this is kind of um, a bit of advice, I guess, for 
um, Melbournians especially right now, as, as someone who has like their finger on the pulse of what's happening, what would be your advice to Melbournians right now who are still sort of challenging these lockdowns? Oh, gosh, um, I don't know that I am able to uh, offer that kind of advice. Um, oh, gosh, and I'm not sure that I'm the person with the finger on the pulse necessarily. <laughs> um, but I, I just, my thought is I hope we will all come through this sooner or later. Sooner or mm. later there will be a vaccine or a cure or some discovery that will change things, I think. I think for all of us, it's a matter of staying safe and hanging in there until that happens. And let's hope it happens soon. It's about all I can say, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of politics on, on either side about these things, and I don't really get into the politics of it except reporting it. So uh, mm. um, it's about the best I can do, Michael, I think. But I think, I think we have to, you know, hang in there, look after each other, look out for each other if possible, and, uh, and hope that it all that it all gets back to some kind of normal soon. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a, a lovely way to put it, just sort of look after each other and be kind to each other. And hopefully hopefully we're on the home stretch in terms of easing restrictions as well in, Mel in Melbourne. But, um, yeah, Pete, if, if people wanted to connect more with you, um, where would be the best place that they can find you and sort of connect with both yourself and also Nine? Nine News, well, we're on all the social uh, media platforms. Uh, I personally am. My uh, username is phitchener9, the numeral nine at the end. And uh, I try to follow everyone back. It's not always possible, though, because there are limits on who you can follow back or how many people you can follow back. And I'm pretty much up to my <laughs> limits uh, on Snapchat and uh, Instagram, um, uh, different for Facebook and Twitter. Um, but I try to, I try to answer um, questions and things. Also, I do have a weekly newsletter. So if, if anyone would like to uh, check out what's been going on during the week, and again, the newsletter is about soft things, happy things, lighthearted things. It's just about life, uh, not about sort of dramatic, you know, politics or anything like that. Just a little bit of a, a lighthearted look at the world. And that is, uh, you can subscribe on peterhitchener.com.au. So, uh, so I'd love you to do that if you felt like it. Every time that newsletter hits my inbox every week, it always gives me a bit of a pick me up because it's so it's so positive and happy. So um, yeah, definitely go sign up for that one if you're um looking for a bit of a, a pick me up. So thank you. Thank you. I didn't um, know you were you were a subscriber. Thank you. I'm most most grateful. Absolutely. <laughs> no worries at all. Well, Peter, this has been an absolute pleasure, and I can't thank you enough for your time. And um, yeah, if anyone is ever looking for um, a bit of an update and a bit of, I guess, an impartial look at what's happening in the news and what's happening in the world, um, join Peter at six o'clock on Channel Nine on weekdays. So yeah, Peter, um, thank you so much for joining us, and yeah, really appreciate your time. So look after yourself. Thank you, and I'm most honoured to have been interviewed. Thanks, Michael. Cheers. Oh, that's very kind. Uh, the feeling is very mutual that I feel very honoured to be able to um, have a chat to you as well. So, um, yeah, thanks so much, Peter. We'll, um, we'll chat to you soon. Cheers. Cool. And thank you all for joining as well. I hope you had an... Um, hope you learnt a lot about Peter. I think he's just a fantastic person and um, very kind and gentle as well, so really appreciate his time. And I want to thank all of you... It's been such a fun experience doing this show for the last 10 weeks. And next week, we're going to be doing a wrap-up show of the last uh, 10 episodes we've been doing, sort of hearing from some of the highlights of all of our guests. So uh, definitely check that one out because it's a great recap of all the fantastic people we've spoken to so far on Momentum Live. But until then, my name's Michael Hardinge. Stay safe. We'll see you next week.